Hey guys, don't forget to stick around till the end where I read some celebrity mean tweets. Or at least my version of them. I've been wanting to do a follow-up to the near-death experience video that I made about Oshkosh. I think overall it was received very well, but there are a few people that made some judgments based on you know, limited information, the way that the video was edited, and quite frankly some poor terminology that I used during the video. As I mentioned in that video, my main goal was hopefully to help others learn from maybe a mistakes that I've made um, or mistakes that I've learned from from other people's videos. It wasn't intended to be any kind of full instructional video. I'm not a CFI, you know, I'm not qualified to explain those things in full detail. What I was trying to emphasize was the fact that when you're operating at slow speeds, first you want to make sure you keep your speed, and second you want to make sure that you're using your rudder and not your ailerons to control your aircraft. I've never actually even been through spin training, so for whatever reason when I got my pilot's license back in 2014, I guess it wasn't a requirement to go through spin training. We didn't do any type of spin training. Uh, once I got my pilot certificate, I flew about a 90 to 100 hours in Cessnas and then eventually transitioned to Cirrus. And of course in a Cirrus you're not going to do any kind of spin training, so I've been flying Cirrus now for over 500 hours until I got into the Highlander. So one of the first things I wanted to clarify was that I was not competing in any type of stole competition. We were simply flying the pattern. So at Air Ventures, there are two times per day where you're allowed to fly the ultralight pattern and do normal takeoffs and landings to a full stop after you've attended the daily briefing each morning where they remind you of the rules as well as some of the dangers that you might encounter when you're flying the ultralight pattern. One of those dangers was the fact that we were flying the pattern with other aircraft and not aircraft of the same type. For example, there were several trikes in the pattern throughout the week that are significantly slower than we were, so we would have to sidestep those aircraft um, toward the inside of the pattern. Um, as you'll see here, it's also not a standard traffic pattern, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail later. So I don't actually compete in any stole competitions. I just simply don't like flying that slowly. I've now been flying a Highlander for about 100 hours. Um, I'm getting very comfortable in the aircraft, but again, I don't like flying slowly, which leads to another point that I wanted to make. I'm an extremely conservative pilot. Can't say as much about my driving, but that's a whole different matter. But when it comes to flying, I know that there are no do-overs. So I don't want to put myself in a position where you know, I might make a stupid mistake, or get too slow, you know, do something that I can easily avoid. I think this conservative nature also explains some of the terminology that I used in the first video. I think I used the term at stall speed or very close to stall speed, when in reality I was nowhere near actual stall speed of my aircraft. I've noticed that flying the pattern or on final approach even, if I'm anywhere below 60 miles per hour, that's just an uncomfortable speed for me. Ironically, after posting this video and doing a lot more research, um, several people mentioned DMMS to me. I had heard the term, I had seen many of Dan Greider's videos, um, but DMMS stands for Defined Minimum Maneuvering Speed. And the way to calculate your defined minimum maneuvering speed is to take your stall speed and multiply it by 1.404. Now I'm not going to get into all the science and the calculations behind how you come up with 1.404. Please check out some of those videos from Dan Greider to understand that a little bit better. Uh, but if I take my stall speed of about 40 miles per hour and multiply by 1.404, I end up with 56 miles an hour. So really for me, my uncomfortable speed is right around DMMS. So as I'm flying the pattern in Oshkosh, I'm still maintaining DMMS throughout the entire flight. One of the other things about the aircraft is I don't have a stall horn, so I think that's part of the reason I don't like getting too slow in the plane because I don't have any indication that I'm approaching a stall. So again, other than my own feel, um, I don't have any indication of that from the aircraft itself. So I always like to keep that buffer myself around 56 to 60 miles an hour. And again, really, I almost never get down to 56. So I talked a little bit about the unusual pattern in Oshkosh. And let me talk a little bit more about that and kind of explain uh, the video. and Just give everybody a little bit more background on exactly what happened. So the last video started around turn number one. As I approached turn number two, this is where I was approaching the trike. 
as I got closer to turn number three, that's when I recognized that I was getting a little bit too close to Gary. I knew what a good safe distance was for me so that if an aircraft touches down on the runway and they didn't exit the runway quickly, um, you could get into a scenario where I'm about to try to touch down and I would see that aircraft on the runway and then I'd have to execute a go around. So what I was trying to do was buy myself just a little bit more time because I felt a little too close. Again, not any danger of me running into him in the air or anything like that, but again, on touchdown, wanted to make sure that he had plenty of time to exit the runway. So as I come here to turn number four, I swing a little bit wider than I had been throughout the week just to give myself a little bit more time or give Gary a little bit more time to get on the ground, get off the runway. So I swing wide on turn number four and then again as I approach turn number five, still maintaining good speed, maintaining good control of the aircraft, but when that gust hit me, put me into a situation where it just felt really uncomfortable. As you can see from the unedited clip, I did relax the elevator. You know, people could argue that I should have pushed further forward on the elevator. I felt at the time I gave it what it needed. I did relax the elevator, use the rudder to you know, maintain the aircraft and, and prevent it from yawing even more. And then when I felt comfortable, you know, gave it some power and executed the go around. So at the time, I felt like I gave it what it needed to recover from that situation. But again, had I not watched some of these other videos and breakdowns of what happened to Tom in Nebraska, you know, I don't know that those things would have been fresh in my mind. Speaking of Dan Greider, he actually reached out to me this weekend to ask permission to use my original video uh, to do a breakdown. Uh, after talking to him, I sort of begrudgingly gave him permission to use it. Uh, I say begrudgingly because I've been wanting to create this follow-up video to, to clarify a few things for a while now. Um, hopefully that helps clarify some things, but I think Dan will probably still use the first video and have plenty of things to criticize about. But at the same time, you know, if he can use that as a tool to help other people become better pilots, then, you know, so be it. And, uh, you know, I'll happily take the criticism from Dan and hopefully learn from it myself as well. And, you know, if you can't stand the heat, then get out the kitchen. So if you're still watching the video, I appreciate you sticking around. I thought it'd be fun, as I mentioned at the beginning, to do uh, some celebrity mean tweets. Uh, obviously, I'm no celebrity, but I've been seeing a bunch of these on YouTube lately where celebrities read mean tweets that people have written about them and then you get their reaction to that. So I thought it'd be kind of a fun way to you know, read some of the comments that I've gotten uh, on that last video and, and respond to a few of those. The first one that I thought was pretty entertaining was from Gobstapa. He says, my advice, learn to fly. Learn to know the limits of your airplane in all conditions. Above all, wake up, fool. I guess he is a Mr. T fan. <laughs> Let's see, another one is from Chris Norman. He says, I think he's referring to Tom, uh, Tom passing away. He says, he did not pass away. He died. It's an adult thing. Okay. Apparently I'm not an adult, I guess, because I said he passed away. Whatever. Uh, another comment from Barley Paul. He says, so with Tom's tragedy, is balls to the wall and gain altitude out of the pattern an acceptable correction? Or was there just too much traffic? So there wasn't too much traffic, but I think as you can see from the diagrams earlier in the video, uh, it is a pretty tight space there. So, you know, there's no exit, for example, out to the east. Um, there, there are some limited options, but at the same time, I didn't feel like I was in a situation where I needed to go, as you say, balls to the wall to gain altitude. Um, I, I was perfectly controlled into that last turn, again, with the gust hitting the wing and, and you know, pushing that wing down certainly got me in an uncomfortable situation. But really, up until that point, I was not in an uncomfortable situation or at, you know, a slow speed or anything like that. This next one I'm particularly proud of because I am a huge Tombstone fan, huge Doc Holliday fan. Doc Holliday commented, DMMS. Man, thanks, Doc. I had no idea aviation was even around back in your day. 
Uh, another comment from Hall Effect One. This was a lot less exciting to watch than I was expecting, but I'm happy for it. Glad you are safe. I'm glad I'm safe as well. Thank you. And finally, from Pompey Monkey, he says, "Old, bold, etc." Obviously referring to the old saying, there are old pilots and there are bold pilots. There are no old, bold pilots. Thankfully, I am neither of those, at least not yet.